St. Bertrand de Comanges is a decayed town on the spurs of the Pyrenees, not very far from Toulouse. It was the site of a bishopric until the Revolution, and has a cathedral that is visited by a certain number of tourists. In 1883, an Englishman arrived at this old-world place, I can hardly dignify it with the name of a city, for there are not a thousand inhabitants. He was a Cambridge man, who had come specially to see St. Bertrand's Church, and had left two friends, who were less keen archaeologists than himself, in their hotel at Toulouse, under promise to join him on the following morning. Our Englishman, let us call him Deniston, had come early on the day in question, and proposed to fill a notebook and to use several dozen plates in the process of describing and photographing every corner of the wonderful church that dominates the little hill of Comanche. The verger was accordingly sent for, and when he came, the Englishman found him an unexpectedly interesting object of study. It was not in the personal appearance of the little dry, wizened old man, but in a curious, furtive, or rather hunted and oppressed air which he had. He was perpetually glancing behind him, and the muscles of his back and shoulders seemed hunched in a continual nervous contraction, as if he were expecting every moment to find himself in the clutch of an enemy. The Englishman hardly knew whether to put him down as a man haunted by a fixed delusion, or as one oppressed by a guilty conscience, or as an unbearably henpecked husband. The probabilities, when reckoned up, certainly pointed to the last idea, but still the impression conveyed was that of a more formidable persecutor than even a termagant wife. As Deniston examined first the stalls, then the enormous dilapidated organ and objects in the treasure chamber, the sacristan kept on his heels the whole time, every now and then whipping round as if he'd been stung, when one or other of the strange noises that trouble a large empty building fell on his ear. Curious noises they were too, sometimes. Once, Deniston said to me, I could have sworn I heard a thin metallic voice laughing high up in the tower. I darted an inquiring look at my sacristan. He was white to the lips. It is he. That is, uh, it is no one. Uh, the door is locked, was all he said. And we looked at each other for a full minute. Another little incident puzzled Deniston a good deal. He was examining a large, dark picture that hangs behind the altar, titled, How St. Bernard Delivered a Man Whom the Devil Long Sought to Strangle, when he noticed his companion on his knees, gazing at the picture with the eye of a suppliant in agony, his hands tightly clasped, and with a rain of tears on his cheeks. The man must be a monomaniac, the Englishman thought to himself. But what was his monomania? It was nearly five o'clock. The short day was drawing in, and the church began to fill with shadows. The sacristan began for the first time to show signs of hurry and impatience, so Deniston packed up his camera and notebook and proceeded to the door. On the doorstep, and for the first time that day, the two men fell into conversation. Monsieur seemed to interest himself in the old choir books in the sacristy, uh, undoubtedly, I was going to ask you if there was a library in the town. No, monsieur. Here came a strange pause of irresolution, and then with a sort of plunge he went on, But if monsieur is amateur de vieux livre, I have at home something that might interest him. It is uh, but a hundred yards away. All at once, Deniston's cherished dreams of finding priceless manuscripts in untrodden corners of France flashed up. He would be foolish not to go. He would reproach himself for ever after if he refused. So they set off. Arriving on his doorstep, the sacristan paused a moment. Perhaps, he said, perhaps after all, Monsieur has not the time. Not at all, lots of time. Nothing to do till tomorrow. Let us see what it is that you've got. The door was opened at this point, and a face looked out. Plainly, it was the sacristan's daughter. She exchanged a few words with her father, of which Deniston caught only these, said by the old man. He was laughing in church, words which were answered only by a look of terror from the girl. But in another minute they were in the sitting-room of the house, a small high chamber with a stone floor full of moving shadows cast by a wood fire that flickered on a great hearth. 
something of the character of an oratory was imparted to it by a tall crucifix. The figure upon it was painted in natural colours. The cross itself was black. Under this stood a chest of some age and solidity, wherefrom the sacristan produced a large book wrapped in white cloth, on which a cross was rudely embroidered in red thread. The next moment the book was open, and Deniston felt he had at last lit on something better than good. Before him lay a large folio bound, perhaps in the late seventeenth century, with the arms of Canon Alberic de Molion stamped in gold on the sides. There may have been a hundred and fifty leaves of paper in the book, and on almost every one of them was fastened a leaf from an illuminated manuscript. Such a collection Deniston had hardly dreamed of in his wildest moments. Here were ten leaves from a copy of Genesis, illustrated with pictures which could not be later than A.D. seven hundred. Further on was a complete set of pictures from a psalter of English execution of the very finest the thirteenth century could produce. Deniston glanced up at the sacristan to see if his face yielded any hint that the book was for sale. He was pale. If Monsieur will turn on to the end, so Monsieur turned on, and at the end of the book, he came across two sheets of paper of a more recent date than anything had yet seen. They must be contemporary, he decided, with the unprincipled Canon Alberic, who had doubtless plundered the chapter library of St. Bertrand to form this priceless scrapbook. On one sheet was a drawing representing a biblical theme, and on the right was a king on his throne. Evidently, King Solomon. On the pavement before him were grouped four soldiers surrounding a crouching figure, which I will describe in a moment. A fifth soldier lay dead on the pavement, his neck distorted, and his eyeballs starting from his head. The four surrounding guards were looking at the king, and in their faces, the sentiment of horror was intensified. They seemed, in fact, only restrained from flight by their implicit trust in their master. All this terror was plainly excited by the being that crouched in their midst. At first, you only saw a mass of coarse, matted black hair. Presently, it was seen that this covered a body of fearful thinness, almost a skeleton, but with the muscles standing out like wires. The hands were hideously taloned. The eyes, touched in with a burning yellow. Had intensely black pupils, and were fixed upon the king, with a look of beast-like hate. Deniston stole a look at his hosts. The sacristan's hands were pressed upon his eyes. His daughter was telling her beads feverishly. At last, the question was asked: "Is this book for sale?" There was the same hesitation, the same plunge of determination he had noticed before. And then came the welcome answer: "If Monsieur pleases." How much do you ask for it? I will take two hundred and fifty francs. My good man, Deniston said, "Your book is worth more, I assure you, far more." But the answer did not vary. There was really no possibility of refusing such a chance. The money was paid, a glass of wine drunk over the transaction, and Deniston made to leave, stepping out into the passage with the book under his arm. Here he was met by the daughter, Monsieur," she said. "Here is a silver crucifix and chain for the neck.、Uh, would you perhaps be good enough to accept it?" Deniston had much use for these things, but the request was unmistakably genuine, and he was reduced to profuse thanks. He then submitted to having the chain put round his neck. As he set off with his book, the sacristan and his daughter stood at the door, looking after him, and were still looking when he waved them a last good night. From the steps of his hotel, dinner was over, and Deniston was in his bedroom, shut up alone with his acquisition. The landlady had manifested a particular interest in him since he had told her that he had paid a visit to the sacristan and bought an old book from him. He thought too that he had heard a hurried dialogue between her and the said sacristan in the passage outside the salle à manger. Some words to the effect that. Pierre and Bertrand would be sleeping in the house. Had closed the conversation. He had taken the crucifix off and laid it on the table when his attention was caught by an object lying on the red cloth. 
just by his left elbow. Two or three ideas of what it might be flitted through his brain with their own incalculable quickness. A pen wiper? No, no such thing in the house. A rat? No, too black. A large spider? Oh, I trust to goodness not. N no. Good God! A hand! A hand! Like the one in that picture! In another infinitesimal flash he had taken it in. Pale, dusty skin, covering nothing but bones and tendons of appalling strength. Coarse black hairs, longer than ever grew on a human hand. Nails rising from the end of the fingers and curving sharply down and forward. Grey, horny, and wrinkled. He flew out of his chair with inconceivable terror, clutching at his heart. The shape, whose left hand rested on the table, was rising to a standing posture behind his seat. Its right hand crooked above its scalp. There was black and tattered drapery about it. The coarse hair covered it as in the drawing. The lower jaw was thin, shallow, like a beast's. Teeth showed behind the black lips. There was no nose. The eyes and the exulting hate and thirst to destroy life which shone there were the most horrifying features of the whole vision. There was intelligence of a kind in them, intelligence beyond that of a beast, below that of a man. Deniston grasped blindly at the crucifix, screamed and, and then swooned. Pierre and Bertrand, the two serving men, rushed in but saw nothing. But they did feel themselves being thrust aside by something that passed out in between them. They sat up with Deniston for the remainder of the night, until his two friends arrived shortly after nine o'clock the following morning. The sacristan was also present, and upon being told the story of the previous night's events, evinced no surprise. It is he, it is he, I have seen him myself twice, but I have felt his presence a thousand times. He would tell them nothing of the provenance of the book, nor any details of his experiences. I shall soon sleep, was all he would say, and my rest will be sweet. Why should you trouble me? He was to die the following summer. We shall never know what he or Canon Alberic de Molion suffered. At the back of the fateful drawing were some lines of writing which may be supposed to throw light on the situation. The dispute of Solomon with the demon of the night Drawn by Alberic de Moulion. O Lord, make haste to help me. St. Bertrand, who put his devils to flight, pray for me most unhappy. I saw it first on the night of December the 12th, 1694. Soon I shall see it for the last time. I have sinned and have suffered, and have more to suffer yet. I have never quite understood what was Deniston's view of the events I have narrated. He quoted to me once a text from Ecclesiasticus. Some spirits there are created for vengeance, and in their fury lay on sore strokes. On another occasion he said, Isaiah was a very sensible man. Doesn't he say something about night monsters living in the ruins of Babylon? These things are rather beyond us at present. The drawing was photographed and then burnt by Deniston on the day when he left Comminges on the occasion of his first visit. It was, as far as I can ascertain, in September of the year 1811 that a post-chaise drew up before the door of Aswerby Hall in the heart of Lincolnshire. The little boy, who was the only passenger, jumped out as soon as it had stopped and looked about him with the keenest curiosity during the short interval that elapsed between the ringing of the bell and the opening of the hall door. The post-chaise had brought Stephen Elliot from Warwickshire, where some six months before he had been left an orphan. Now, owing to the generous offer of his elderly cousin, Mr. Abney, he had come to live at Aswerby. The offer was unexpected, because all who knew anything of Mr. Abney looked upon him as a somewhat austere recluse, 
into whose steady-going household the advent of a small boy would import a new and, it seemed, incongruous element. The truth is that very little was known of Mr. Abney's pursuits or temper. The professor of Greek at Cambridge had been heard to say that no one knew more of the religious beliefs of the later pagans than did the owner of Aswaby. He was looked upon in fine as a man wrapped up in his books, and it was a matter of great surprise among his neighbours that he should even have heard of his orphan cousin. Whatever the case, it is certain that Mr. Abney, the tall, the thin, the austere, seemed inclined to give his new charge a kindly reception. The moment the front door was opened, he darted out of his study, rubbing his hands with delight. "'How are you, my boy? How are you? How old are you?' said he. Uh, "'That is, uh, you're not too much tired, I hope, by your journey to eat your supper.' Uh, "'No, thank you, sir,' said Master Elliot. "'I'm pretty well.' "'That's a good lad,' said Mr. Abney. "'And how old are you, my boy?' It seemed a little odd that he should have asked the question twice in the first two minutes of their acquaintance. "'I'm twelve years old next birthday, sir,' said Stephen. Uh, uh, "'Sure, it's twelve? You certain?' Uh, "'Yes, quite sure, sir.' Uh, "'Well, well. well uh, take him to Mrs. Bunch's room, Parks, and uh, let him have his tea, uh, supper, whatever it is.' "'Yes, sir,' answered the staid Mr. Parks, and conducted Stephen to the lower regions. Mrs. Bunch was the most comfortable and human person whom Stephen had as yet met at Aswaby, and they were great friends within quarter of an hour. Her residence at the hall was of twenty years standing, and consequently, if anyone knew the ins and outs of the house and district, it was Mrs. Bunch. Nor was she by any means disinclined to communicate her information. One November evening, Stephen was sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, reflecting on his surroundings. "'Is Mr. Abney a good man, and will he go to heaven?' he suddenly asked. "'Good,' said Mrs. Bunch. "'Master's as kind a soul as ever I see. "'Didn't I tell you of the little boy as he took in out the street this seven years back? "'And the little girl, two years after I come here?' "'No, no, do tell me, Mrs. Bunch, this minute.' "'Well,' said Mrs. Bunch, "'this little girl lived with us three weeks, it might be, "'and then one morning she got out of bed "'before any of us had opened an eye, "'and neither track nor trace of her "'have I set eyes on since. Well, "'Master was wonderful put about, "'and had all the ponds dragged, "'but it's my belief she was out of way by gypsies.' "'Oh, dear, dear, an odd child she was, so silent in her ways, and, and so domesticated she was. It was surprising.' "'And what of the little boy?' inquired Stephen. "'Ah, that poor boy,' sighed Mrs. Bunch. "'He were a foreigner. Giovanni called hisself, and he come in the drive one winter day, and master had him in that minute, and asked him all about where he come from, and how old he was, and where were his relatives, and all as kind as I could wish. But it went the same way with him. Oh, they're an unruly lot, them foreign nations. He was off one fine morning just the same as the girl. That night Stephen had a curious dream. He found himself staring through the glazed door of a disused bathroom, situated at the end of a passage at the top of the house. The moon was shining through the window, and he was gazing at a figure which lay in the path. As he looked, a moan seemed to issue from its lips, and the arms began to stir. The terror of the sight forced Stephen backwards, and he awoke to the fact that he was indeed standing on the cold boarded floor of the passage in the full light of the moon. With a courage which I do not think can be common among boys of his age, he went to the door of the bathroom to ascertain if the figure of his dream were really there. It was not, and he went back to bed. The spring equinox was approaching, as Mr. Abney frequently reminded his cousin, adding that this had always been considered by the ancients to be a critical time for the young, and that Stephen would do well to take care of himself and to shut his bedroom window at night. One Friday night in March, Mrs. Bunch was occupying herself in mending his nightgown. "'Oh, gracious me, Master Stephen,' she broke forth rather irritably. "'How do you manage to tear your nightdress all to Flinders this way? "'Oh, look here, sir, what trouble you do give to poor servants after darn and mend after you!' 
There was indeed a most destructive and apparently wanton series of slits or scorings in the garment. They were confined to the left side of the chest, and Stephen was sure they were not there the night before. But Mrs. Bunch, he said, they're just the same as the scratches on the outside of my bedroom door, and I'm sure I never had anything to do with making them. Mrs. Bunch gazed at him, open-mouthed, then snatched up a candle, departed hastily from the room, and was heard making her way upstairs. In a few minutes she came down. Well, she said, Master Stephen, it's a funny thing to me how them marks and scratches can come there. It's too high up for any cat or dog to have made em, much less a rat. For all the world like a Chinaman's finger nails. Oh, I wouldn't say nothing to Master if I was you, my dear. Just turn the key of the door when you go to your bed. We have now arrived at March the 24th, 1812. It was a day of curious experiences for Stephen, a windy, noisy day, which filled the house and the gardens with a restless impression. As Stephen stood by the fence of the grounds and looked out into the park, he felt as if an endless procession of unseen people were sweeping past him on the wind, borne on resistlessly and aimlessly, vainly trying to stop themselves, to catch at something that might resist their flight and bring them back again into contact with the living world of which they had formed a part. After luncheon that day, Mr. Abney said, "'Stephen, my boy, do you think you could manage to come to me tonight as late as eleven o'clock in my study? I shall be busy until that time, and I wish to show you something connected with your future life, which is most important that you should know. You are not to mention this matter to Mrs. Bunch or to anyone else, and you better go to your room at the usual time. Here was a new excitement added to life. Stephen eagerly grasped at the opportunity of sitting up till eleven o'clock. He looked in at the library door on his way upstairs that evening, and saw a brazier, which he had often noticed in the corner of the room, moved out before the fire. An old silver gilt cup stood on the table, filled with red wine, and some written sheets of paper lay near it. Mr. Apney was sprinkling some incense on the brazier from a round silver box as Stephen passed, but didn't seem to notice his step. The wind had fallen, and there was a still night and a full moon. At about ten o'clock Stephen was standing at the open window of his bedroom. From time to time strange cries as of lost and despairing wanderers sounded from across the mere. They might be the notes of owls or water-birds, yet they did not resemble either sound. Were they not coming nearer? Abruptly they ceased. But just as Stephen was thinking of shutting the window and resuming his reading of Robinson Crusoe, he caught sight of two figures standing on the gravel terrace that ran along the garden side of the hall. The figures of a boy and girl, it seemed. They stood side by side, looking up at the windows. Something in the form of the girl recalled irresistibly his dream of the figure in the bath. The boy inspired him with more acute fear. Whilst the girl stood still, half smiling, with her hands clasped over her heart, the boy, a thin shape with black hair and ragged clothing, raised his arms in the air with an appearance of menace and of unappeasable hunger and longing. The moon shone upon his transparent hands, and Stephen saw that the nails were fearfully long, and that the light shone through them. And as he stood with his arms thus raised, he disclosed a terrifying spectacle. On the left side of his chest there opened a black and gaping rent, and there fell upon Stephen's brain, rather than upon his ear, the impression of one of those hungry and desolate cries that he had heard resounding over the woods of Aswerby all evening. In another moment this dreadful pair had moved swiftly and noiselessly over the dry gravel, and he saw them no more. Inexpressibly frightened as he was, he determined to take his candle and go down to Mr. Abney's study, for the hour appointed for their meeting was at hand. The study, or library, opened out on the front hall on one side, and Stephen, urged on by his terrors, did not take long in getting there. His repeated knocks were not answered. Mr. Abney was engaged. He was speaking. What? What? 
Why did he try to cry out? And why was the cry choked in his throat? Had he too seen the mysterious children? But now everything was quiet, and the door yielded to Stephen's pushing. On the table in Mr. Abney's study, certain papers were found which explained the situation to Stephen Elliot when he was of an age to understand them. The most important sentences were as follows. It was a belief very strongly and generally held by the ancients that by enacting certain processes which to us moderns would have something of a barbaric complexity, a very remarkable enlightenment of the spiritual faculties in man may be attained, that, for example, by absorbing the personalities of a certain number of his fellow creatures, an individual may gain a complete ascendancy over those orders of spiritual beings which control the elemental forces of our universe. It is recorded of Simon Magus that he was able to fly in the air or to assume any form he pleased by the agency of the soul of a boy whom, to use the libelous phrase employed by the author of the Clementine Recognitions, he had murdered. I find it set down, moreover, with considerable detail in the writings of Hermes Trismegistus that similar happy results may be produced by the absorption of the hearts of not less than three human beings below the age of twenty-one years. To the testing of the truth of this receipt, I have devoted the greater part of the last twenty years selecting as the corpora viliar of my experiment such persons as could be conveniently removed without occasioning a sensible gap in society. The first step I effected by the removal of a gypsy girl, the second by that of a wandering Italian lad, my final victim will be my cousin, Stephen Elliot. His day must be this March the 24th. 1812. The best means of effecting the required absorption is to remove the heart from the living subject, to reduce it to ashes, and to mingle them with about a pint of some red wine, preferably port. The remains of the first two subjects at least it will be well to conceal. A disused bathroom will be found convenient for such a purpose." Mr. Abney was found in his chair, his head thrown back, his face stamped with an expression of rage, fright, and mortal pain. In his left side was a terrible, lacerated wound, exposing the heart. There was no blood on his hands, and a long knife on the table was perfectly clean. The window of the study was open, and it was in the opinion of the coroner that Mr. Abney had met his death by the agency of some wild creature. But Stephen Elliot's study of the papers I have quoted led him to a very different conclusion. Two men in a smoking room were talking of their private school days. At our school, said A, we had a ghost's footmark on the staircase. What was it like? Oh, very unconvincing, just the shape of a shoe with a square toe, if I remember right. The staircase uh, was a stone one. I, I never heard any story about the thing. But that seems odd when you come to think of it. Why didn't someone invent one, I wonder? You can never tell with little boys. They have a mythology of their own. Uh, there's a subject for you, by the way, the folklore of private schools. Yes, uh, the crop is rather scanty, though. I imagine if you were to investigate the cycle of ghost stories, for instance, which the boys at private schools tell each other, they would all turn out to be highly compressed versions of stories out of books. Nowadays, the Strand and Pearsons and so on would be extensively drawn upon. Yeah, no doubt, said A. Publications like that weren't born or thought of in my time. Now, let's see. Now, I wonder if I can remember the staple ones that I was told. First... There was a house with a room in which a series of people insisted on passing a night, and each of them in the morning was found kneeling in a corner, and just had time to say, I've seen it, and died. <laughs> I've got one. Uh, 
um, there was a man who heard a noise in the passage at night, opened his door, and saw someone crawling towards him on all fours with his eye hanging out on his cheek. Yeah, th there was besides. Uh, yes, let me think. Uh, yes, the the room where a man was found dead in a bed with a horseshoe mark on his forehead, and the floor under the bed was covered with marks of horseshoes also. I, I don't know why. There also, there was a lady who, on knocking her bedroom door in a strange house, heard a thin voice among the bed curtains saying, Now we are shut in for the night. <laughs> well, none of those had any explanation or sequel. Yes, I wonder if they still go on, those stories. Oh, likely enough, with additions from the magazines, as I say. You, you never heard, did you, of a real ghost at a private school? Mm, no, I thought not. Nobody has that I ever came across. From the way in which you said that, I gather that you have. Actually, I, I do. It happened at my private school thirty-odd years ago, and I haven't any explanation of it, although I've told it many times. The, the school, I mean, was near London. I first went there in September, soon after the year 1870, and among the boys who arrived on the same day was one whom I took to, a Highland boy, whom I will call MacLeod. I needn't spend time in describing him. The main thing is that I came to know him well. He was not an exceptional boy in any way, not particularly good at games or books, but he suited me. At one term, perhaps it was my third or fourth, a new master made his appearance. His name was Samson. He was a tallish, stoutish, pale, black-bearded man. I think we liked him. He had travelled a good deal, and had stories which amused us on our school walks, so that there was some competition among us to get within earshot of him. I remember, too, that he had a charm on his watch-chain that attracted my attention one day, and he let me examine it. It was, I now know, a gold Byzantine coin. There was the image of some absurd emperor on one side of it. The other side had worn practically smooth, and he had cut on it, rather barbarously, his own initials, G.W.S., and a date, 24th of July, 1865. Yes, I can see it now. He told me he picked it up in Constantinople. It was about the size of a florin, perhaps rather smaller. Well, the first odd thing that happened was like this. Samson was doing Latin grammar with us. One of his favourite methods, perhaps it's rather a good one, was to make us construct sentences out of our own heads to illustrate the rules he was trying to make us learn. Of course, that's a thing which gives silly boys the chance of being impertinent, but Samson was too good a disciplinarian for us to think of trying that on him. Now, on this occasion, he was telling us how to express remembering in Latin, and he ordered us each to make a sentence bringing in the verb memini, I remember. Well, most of us made up some ordinary, rather uninteresting sentence, except the boy I mentioned, MacLeod, who was obviously thinking of something more elaborate than I remember my father or whatever. The rest of us wanted to have our sentences passed and get on to something else, so I poked him and whispered to him to look sharp, but he didn't seem to attend. I looked at his paper and saw that he'd put down nothing at all. So I jogged him again harder than before and upbraided him sharply for keeping us waiting. That did have some effect. He started and seemed to wake up, and then, very quickly, he scribbled down about a couple of lines on his paper and showed it up with the rest. As it was the last to come in, and as Samson had a lot to say to the boys who had written Meminiscimus Patri Meo, it turned out that the clock struck twelve before he had got to MacLeod, and MacLeod had to wait behind to have his sentence corrected. There was nothing much going on outside when I got out, so I waited for him to come. He walked out very slowly, and I guessed there had been some sort of trouble. Well, I said, what did you get? Oh, I don't know, said MacLeod. Nothing much. But I think Samson's rather annoyed with me. Why, did you show him up some rot? Oh, no fear, he said. It was all right as far as I could see. Uh, it was like this. Memento putei inter quater taxus. What silly rot, I said. What made you shove that down? What does it mean? That's the funny part, said MacLeod. All I know is it just came into my head and I corked it down. I mean, I know what I think it means, because just before I wrote it down, I had a sort of picture of it in my head. I believe it means, remember the well among the four...
uh, what are those dark sort of trees that have red berries on them? Mountain ashes, I suppose you mean, I replied. Oh, I never heard of them, said MacLeod. No, I I'll tell you, they're, they're yews. Well, and what does Samson say? Why, he, he was jolly odd about it. I mean, when he read it, he got up and he went to the mantelpiece and he stopped quite a long time without saying anything with his back to me. And then he said, without turning round and rather quietly, What do you suppose that means? I told him what I thought, only I couldn't remember the name of those silly trees. And then he wanted to know why I had put it down. And I had to say something or other. And after that, he left off talking about it. But he wasn't looking a bit well. Next day, MacLeod took to his bed with a chill or something of the kind, and it was a week or so before he was in school again. Whether or not Mr. Samson was really startled, as MacLeod had thought, he didn't show it. I'm pretty sure, of course, now, that there was something very curious in his past history. There was one other incident of the same kind. Several times since that day, we had to make up examples in school to illustrate different rules, but there'd never been any row except when we did them wrong. At last there came a day when we were going through those dismal things which people call conditional sentences, and we were told to make a conditional sentence expressing a future consequence. We did it, right or wrong, and showed our bits of paper, and Samson began looking at them. All at once he got up, made some sort of odd noise in his throat, and rushed out of the door. We sat there for a minute or two, and then, I suppose it was incorrect, but we went up, I and one or two others, to look at the papers on his desk. Well, the top paper on his desk was written in red ink, which no one used, and it wasn't in anyone's handwriting who was in the class. They all looked at it, MacLeod and all, and took their dying oaths that it wasn't theirs. Then I thought of counting the bits of paper, and of this I made quite certain that there were seventeen bits of paper on the desk and sixteen boys in the form. Well, I bagged the extra paper and kept it, and I believe I have it now. And now you'll want to know what was written on it. It was simple enough and harmless enough, I should have said. Si tu non veneris ad me, ego veniam ad te, which means, I suppose, if you don't come to me, I'll come to you. That same afternoon I took it out of my locker. I know for certain it was the same bit, for I made a finger mark upon it, and no single trace of writing of any kind was there on it. I kept it, as I said, and since that time I've tried various experiments to see whether invisible ink had been used, but absolutely without result. So much for that. After about half an hour, Samson looked in again, said he'd felt very unwell, and told us we might go. Next day he was in school again, much as usual. That night, the third and last incident in my story happened. We, MacLeod and I, slept in a dormitory at night, at right angles to the main building on the first floor. There was a very bright full moon. At an hour which I can't tell exactly, but some time between one and two, I was woken by somebody shaking me. It was MacLeod, and a nice state of mind he seemed to be in. Come, he said, come, there's a burglar getting in through Samson's window. As soon as I could speak, I said, Well, why not call out and wake everybody up? No, no, he said, I'm not sure who it is. Don't make a row. Come and look. Well, naturally, I came and looked, and naturally there was no one there. I was cross enough and should have called MacLeod plenty of names, only I couldn't tell why. It seemed to me there was something wrong, something that made me glad I wasn't alone to face it. We were still at the window looking out, and as soon as I could, I asked him what he'd heard or seen. I didn't hear anything at all, he said, but about five minutes before I woke you, I found myself looking out of this window here, and there was a man sitting or kneeling on Samson's window sill and looking in, and I thought he was beckoning. He was beastly thin, and he looked as if he was wet all over, and, he said, looking round and whispering, as if he hardly liked to hear himself, I'm not at all sure that he was alive. The next day Mr. Sampson was gone, not to be found.
and I believe no trace of him has ever come to light since. In thinking it over, one of the oddest things about it all has seemed to me to be the fact that neither MacLeod nor I ever mentioned what we had seen to any third person whatever. We seemed unable to speak about it at the time. Over the years, however, I have told the tale a number of times. Once to a gentleman who had been staying at a country house in Ireland. One evening his host was turning over a drawer full of odds and ends in the smoking room. Suddenly he put his hands on a little box. Now, he said, you know about old things. Tell me what that is. My friend opened the little box and found in it a thin gold chain with an object attached to it. Well, what's the history of this? he asked. Odd enough, was the answer. You know the yew thicket in the shrubbery? Well, a year or two back we were clearing out the old well that used to be in the clearing here. And what do you suppose we found? Is it possible you found a, a, a body? said the visitor, with an odd feeling of nervousness. We did that. But what's more, in every sense of the word, we found two. Good heavens, two! Was there anything to show how they got there? Uh, was this thing found with them? It was. Amongst the rags and the clothes that were on one of the bodies. It is a bad business, whatever the story of it may have been. One body had the arms tight round the other. Oh, they must have been there for thirty years or more. Long enough before we came to this place. You may judge, we filled the well up fast enough. Do you make anything of what's caught on that gold coin you have there? I think I can, said my friend, holding it to the light. It seems to be GWS, 24th of July, 1865. "'I suppose you get stuff of that kind through your hands pretty often,' said Mr. Dillett, as he pointed with his stick to an object which shall be described when the time comes. And when he said it, he lied in his throat, and he knew that he lied. Not once in twenty years, perhaps not once in a lifetime, could Mr. Chittenden, skilled as he was in ferreting out the forgotten treasures of half a dozen countries, expect to handle such a specimen.' How much you sticking the innocent American buyer for it, eh? Oh, I shan't be hard on the buyer, American or otherwise. You see, it stands this way, Mr. Dillett. If I knew just a bit more about the pedigree, though anyone can see for themselves it's a genuine thing, every last corner of it, I should be asking rather more than I am. And um, what's that, five and twenty? Well, multiply that by three and you've got it, sir. Seventy-five's my price. And fifty's mine, said Mr. Dillett. The point of agreement was, of course, somewhere between the two. It does not matter exactly where, I think sixty guineas. But half an hour later the object was being packed, and within an hour Mr. Dillett had called for it in his car and driven away. Mr. Chittenden, holding the cheque in his hand, saw him off from the door with smiles, and returned, still smiling, into the parlour, where his wife was making the tea. He stopped at the door. "'It's gone,' he said. "'Thank you. God for that, said Mrs. Chittenden, putting down the teapot. Mr. Dillett, was it? Yes, it was. Well, I'd sooner it was him than another. Oh, I don't know. He ain't a bad fellow, my dear. Maybe not, but in my opinion, he'd be none the worse for a bit of a shake-up. And what, then, of Mr. Dillett and his new acquisition? What it was, the title of the story will have told you. What it was like, I shall have to indicate as well as I can. There was only just enough room for it in the car, and the drive was an anxious one. At last his door was reached, and Collins, the butler, came out. Uh, "'Look here, Collins, you must help me with this thing. We must get it out upright, see? It's full of little things that mustn't be displaced more than we can help. I think we'll have to put it in my own room, on the big table. Yes, that's it.' It was conveyed to Mr. Dillett's spacious room on the first floor, looking out on the drive. The sheeting was unwound from it and for the next hour or two Mr. Dillett was fully occupied in extracting the packing and setting in order the contents of the rooms. When this congenial task was finished, I must say it would have been difficult to find a more perfect and attractive specimen of a doll's house in Strawberry Hill Gothic 
than that which now stood on Mr. Dillett's knee-hole table. It was quite six foot long, including the chapel and oratory, which flanked the front on the left as you faced it, with the stable on the right. The chapel had pinnacles and buttresses, and a bell in the turret. The stable was of two stories, with a clock, and a gothic cupola for the clock bell. Pages might be written on the outfit of the mansion. How many frying pans, how many gilt chairs, carpets, pictures, and chandeliers there were, but that must be left to the imagination. The house was also fully populated with a gentleman and lady in blue satin and brocade, respectively. There were two children, a boy and a girl. There was a cook, a nurse, a footman, and there were the stable servants, two postilions, a coachman, two grooms. "'Anyone else?' inquired Mr. Dillett. "'Yes, possibly.' The curtains of the four-poster in the bedroom were closely drawn around all four sides of it, and he put his finger in between them and felt in the bed. He drew the finger back hastily, for it almost seemed to him as if something had not stirred, perhaps, but yielded in an odd, live way as he pressed it. Then he put back the curtains, and extracted from the bed a white-haired old gentleman in a long linen nightdress and cap, and laid him down by the rest. The tale was complete. That night Mr. Dillett's whim was to sleep, surrounded by some of the gems of his collection. There was no striking clock within earshot, yet curiously it is indubitable that Mr. Dillett was startled out of a very pleasant slumber by a bell tolling one. Though there was no light at all in the room, the doll's house stood out with complete clearness. There were lights, more than one, in the windows, and Mr. Dillett quickly realised that what he was looking at was no four-roomed house with a movable front, but one of many rooms and staircases, a real house, but seen as if through the wrong end of a telescope. "'You mean to show me something?' he muttered to himself, and gazed earnestly on the lighted windows. Two rooms were lighted, one on the ground floor to the right of the door, one upstairs on the left, the first brightly enough, the other rather dimly. The lower room was the dining room. A meal had been eaten, and only wine and glasses were left on the table. The man of the blue satin and the woman of brocade were seated alone, and they were talking earnestly. The former abruptly rose and left the room, and the expression on the lady's face was that of one striving her utmost to keep down a fear that threatened to master her, and succeeding. It was a hateful face, too, broad, flat, and sly. Now the man came back, and she took some small thing from him and hurried out. He, too, disappeared, but a moment later he could be seen stepping out of the front door, looking this way and that, and then turning to the upper window that was lighted, and shaking his fist. It was time to look at the upper window. Through it was seen a four-poster bed, a nurse or other servant in an armchair, sound asleep, and in the bed an old man lying awake, and, one would say, anxious, from the way in which he shifted about and moved his fingers. Beyond the bed a door opened, and the lady came in. She set down her candle on the table and roused the nurse. In her hand she had an old-fashioned wine bottle, ready uncorked. The nurse took it, poured some of the contents into a little silver saucepan, added some spice and sugar from casters on the table, and set it to warm on the fire. The old man pointed to the window and spoke. The lady nodded, opened the casement, and listened for something, perhaps rather ostentatiously, then drew in her head and shook it, looking at the old man, who seemed to sigh. By this time the posset was ready. The old man waved it away, but he was prevailed upon to drink it, after which the nurse laid him down, the lady left the room, and there was an interval of complete quiet. Suddenly the old man started up in his bed. He must have uttered some cry, for the nurse started out of her chair. He was a sad and terrible sight, flushed in the face almost to blackness, the eyes glaring whitely, both hands clutching at his heart, foam at his lips. The nurse threw open the door and cried for help. 
but as the lady, her husband, and several servants rushed into the room with horrified faces, the old man collapsed under the nurse's hands and lay back, and the features, contorted with agony and rage, relaxed slowly into calm. A few moments later, a coach drove up to the front door. A white-wigged man in black ran up the steps, carrying a small trunk-shaped box. He was met by the man and his wife, who led him to the dining room where he set his box of papers on the table while he listened to their story. He repeatedly nodded his head, declined what seemed an offer of refreshment, and within a few moments left the house and drove away. The man in blue watched him depart, a smile not pleasant to see stealing over his fat white face. The light then faded. Mr. Dillett remained sitting up in bed. He had rightly guessed there would be a sequel. This time the chapel was lit. On the center of the black and white pavement was a bier. A pall of black velvet lay on the floor nearby, and a large candlestick had been overturned. Suddenly, Mr. Dillett's attention was arrested by a strange light away at the top of the house. It was a new sort of light, not of a lamp or candle, a pale, ugly light emanating from the door-case at the back of a room where the boy and girl were lying asleep in two truckle beds. The door was opening. The seer does not like to dwell upon what he saw entering the room. He says it might be described as a frog, the size of a man, but it had scanty white hair about its head. It was busy about the truckle beds, but not for long, the sound of cries, infinitely appalling, reached the ear. There were signs of a hideous commotion all over the house. Lights moved along and up, doors opened and shut, and running figures passed within the windows. The clock in the stable turret told one, and darkness fell again. It was only dispelled once more to show the house front. Dark figures came down the steps, bearing first one, then another, small coffin. The next morning, Mr. Dillett sent for the doctor, who found him in a disquieting state of nerves. He recommended a dose of sea air, and Mr. Dillett duly repaired to a quiet place on the east coast by easy stages in his car. One of the first people he met on the front was Mr. Chittenden, who likewise had taken his wife away for a bit of a change. Mr. Chittenden looked somewhat askance upon him when they met, and not without cause. "'Well, I don't wonder at you being a bit upset, Mr. Dillett. I might say horrible upset, seeing what me and my poor wife went through ourselves. But I'll put it to you, Mr. Dillett. One of two things. Was I going to scrap a lovely piece like that, on the one end, or was I going to tell customers, "'I'm selling you a regular picture palace drama to real life in the olden time, "'billed to perform regular at one o'clock a.m.' "'Well, next thing you know, Mr. and Mrs. Chittenden would be off in a spring cart of the county asylum.' "'Later in the day, in what is offensively called the smoke room of the hotel, "'the two men's conversation continued. "'Honestly, Mr. Dillett, I don't know where it come from. "'It'd be some country house that anyone could guess, but I'll go so far as to say this. "'I believe it's not an hundred miles from this place.' The man I actually paid the cheque to ain't one of my regular suppliers, and I've lost sight of him. But I have the idea that this part of the country was his beat, and that's every word I can tell you. The next day, Mr. Dillett repaired to the local institute, where he hoped to find the clue to the riddle that absorbed him. He gazed in despair at a long line of the Canterbury and York Society's publications of the parish registers of the district. No print resembling the house of his nightmare was among those that hung on the staircase and in the passages. Disconsolate, he found himself at last in a derelict room, staring at a dusty model of a church in a dusty glass case. Model of St. Stephen's Church, Coxham, presented by J. Merriweather, Esquire, of Illbridge House, 1877. The work of his ancestor, James Merriweather, died 1786. There was something in the fashion of it that reminded him dimly of his horror. Dillett hurriedly looked out Ilbridge House in the register. 
It was not long before he found in there the record of the burial of Roger Milford, aged 76, on the 11th of September, 1757, and of Roger and Elizabeth Merriweather, aged nine and seven, on the 19th of the same month. It seemed worthwhile to follow up this clue, and in the afternoon he drove to Coxham. In the north aisle of the church there was the Milford family chapel, on whose walls were tablets to the same persons. One slab told of James Merriweather, who in the dawn of life practised those arts which, had he continued, might have earned for him the name of the British Vitruvius, but who, overwhelmed by the visitation which deprived him of his blooming offspring and later his grieving wife, passed his prime and age in a secluded yet elegant retirement. Mr. Dillett felt sure that in Illbridge House he had found the scene of his drama. But he was unable to satisfy his curiosity. Apparently an older property had been demolished to make way for the red-brick mock Elizabethan dwelling which currently occupies the site. As he drove out of the village, the hall's clock struck four, and Mr. Dillett started up and clapped his hands to his ears. It was not the first time he had heard that bell. And if you was to walk through the bedrooms now, you'd see the ragged, mouldy bedclothes a heaving and a heaving like seas, and a heaving and a heaving with what he says, why, with rats under 'em. But was it with the rats? I ask, because, in another case, it was not. It happened in Suffolk near the coast in a place where the road makes a sudden dip and then a sudden rise. As you go northward, at the top of that rise, stands a house on the left of the road. It is a tall, red-bricked house, narrow for its height. Perhaps it was built around 1770. The top of the front has a low triangular pediment with a round window in the centre. Behind it are stables and offices, and such garden as it has is behind them. Scraggy Scotch firs are near it. An expanse of gorse-covered land stretches away from it. It commands a view of the distant sea from the upper windows of the front. A sign on a post stands before the door, or did so stand, for though it was an inn of repute once, I believe it is so no longer. To this inn came my acquaintance Mr. Thompson, when he was a young man, on a fine spring day, coming from the University of Cambridge, and desirous of solitude in tolerable quarters, and time for reading. These he found, for the landlord and his wife had been in service, and could make a visitor comfortable, and there was no one else staying at the inn. He spent very tranquil and uneventful days, work all the morning, afternoon, perambulation of the country round about, a little conversation with the patrons of the inn over the then fashionable drink of brandy and water, a little more reading and bed. One of his walks took him along the northern road, which traverses the heath. On the bright afternoon, when he first chose this direction, his eye caught a white object some hundreds of yards to the left of the road, and he felt it necessary to make sure what this might be. It was not long before he was standing by it, and found himself looking at a square block of white stone, fashioned somewhat like the base of a pillar, with a square hole in the upper surface. After taking stock of it, he contemplated the view for a few minutes, and so pursued his way back to the inn. In the desultory evening talk at the bar, he asked why the white stone was there on the common. "'An old-fashioned thing, that is,' said the landlord, Mr. Betts. "'We was none of us alive when it was put there.' "'It stands pretty high,' said Mr. Thompson. "'I dare say a sea-mark was on it some time back.' Oh, "'That's right,' said another. "'I've heard they could see it from the boats. "'But whatever there was, it's felt a bits this long time.' "'Yeah, good job, too,' said a second man. "'Twern a lucky mark by what the old man used to say. "'Not lucky for the fish, you know, I mean.' "'But I had some funny ideas, them old chaps, "'and I shouldn't wonder but what they made away with it themselves.'
It was impossible to get anything clearer than this. The company, never very voluble, fell silent, and when next someone spoke, it was Mr. Betts, it was of the village affairs and crops. One fine afternoon, Mr. Thompson found himself busily writing at three o'clock. Then he stretched himself and rose, and walked out of his room into the passage. Facing him was another room, then the stairhead, and then two more rooms, one looking out to the back and the other to the south. At the south end of the passage was a window to which he went, considering with himself that it was rather a shame to waste such a fine afternoon. However, work was paramount just at the moment, and he thought he would just take five minutes off and then go back to it, and those five minutes he would employ, the Betsies couldn't possibly object, to looking at the other rooms in the passage which he'd never seen. Nobody at all, it seemed, was indoors. Probably, as it was market day, they were all gone to the town. Very still the house was. So he explored. The room facing his own was undistinguished, except for an old print of Berry's and Edmund's. The two next him, on his side of the passage, were gay and clean, with one window apiece, whereas his had two. There remained the southwest room, opposite to the last which he had entered. This was locked, but Thompson was in a mood of quite indefensible curiosity, and feeling confident that there could be no damaging secrets in a place so easily got at, he proceeded to fetch the key of his own room, and when that did not answer, to collect the keys to the other three. One of them fitted, and he opened the door. The room had two windows looking south and west, so it was as bright and the sun as hot upon it as it could be. Here there was no carpet but bare boards, no pictures, no washstand, only a bed in the farther corner, an iron bed, with mattress and bolster, covered with a bluish check counterpane. As featureless a room as you can well imagine, and yet there was something that made Thompson close the door very quickly and yet quietly behind him, and lean against the window sill in the passage, actually quivering all over. It was this, that under the counterpane someone lay, and not only lay, but stirred. That it was someone and not something was certain, because the shape of a head was unmistakable on the bolster, and yet it was all covered and no one lies with covered head, but a dead person. And this was not dead, not truly dead, for it heaved and shivered. If he had seen these things in the dusk or by the light of a flickering candle, Thompson could have comforted himself and talked to fancy. On this bright day, that was impossible. What was to be done? First, lock the door at all costs. Very gingerly he approached it, and bending down, listened, holding his breath. Perhaps there might be the sound of heavy breathing. There was absolute silence, but as, with a rather tremulous hand, he put the key into its hole and turned it, it rattled, and on the instant a stumbling, padding tread was heard coming towards the door. Thompson fled like a rabbit to his room and locked himself in. Futile enough he knew it was. Would doors and locks be any obstacle to what he suspected? But it was all he could think of at the moment, and in fact, nothing happened. Only there was a time of acute suspense, followed by a misery of doubt as to what to do. The impulse, of course, was to slip away as soon as possible from a house that contained such an inmate. But only the day before he had said he should be staying at least a week more, and how, if he changed his plans, could he avoid the suspicion of having pried into places where he certainly had no business? Moreover, either the Betsies knew about the inmate, and yet did not leave the house, or knew nothing, which equally meant that there was nothing to be afraid of, or knew just enough to make them shut up the room, but not enough to weigh on their spirits. In any of these cases it seemed that not much was to be feared, and certainly so far he had had no sort of ugly experience. On the whole, the least line of resistance was to stay. Well, he stayed out his week. Nothing took him past that door, and often, as he would pause in a quiet hour of day or night in the passage and listen, no sound whatever issued from that direction. You might have thought that Thompson would have made some attempt 
to ferret out old stories connected with the inn, hardly perhaps from bets, but from the parson of the parish or old people in the village. But no, the reticence which commonly falls on people who have had strange experiences and believe in them was upon him. Nevertheless, as the end of his stay drew near, his yearning after some explanation grew more and more acute, so he hatched a plan. He would leave by an afternoon train about four o'clock. When his fly was waiting and his luggage on it, he would make one last expedition upstairs to look round his own room and see if anything was left unpacked, and then, with that key which he had contrived to oil, as if that made any difference, the door should once more be opened for a moment and shut. So it worked out. The bill was paid, the consequent small talk gone through while the fly was loaded, pleasant part of the country, been very comfortable, thanks to you and Mrs. Betts, hope to come back some time on one side, and on the other, very glad you found satisfaction, sir, done our best, always glad to have your good word, very much favoured we've been with the weather, to be sure. And then, I'll just take a look upstairs in case I've left a book or something out. No, don't trouble, I'll be back in a minute. And as noiselessly as possible, he stole to the door and opened it. The shattering of the illusion. He almost laughed aloud. Propped, or you might say sitting on the edge of the bed, was nothing in the round world but a scarecrow. A scarecrow out of the garden, of course. <laughs> Dumped into the deserted room. Yes. But here the amusement ceased. Have scarecrows bare bony feet? Do their heads loll on their shoulders? Have they iron collars and links of chain about their necks? Can they get up and move, if never so stiffly, across a floor with wagging head and arms close at their sides, and shiver? The slam of the door, the dash to the stairhead, the leap downstairs, were followed by a faint. Awaking, Thompson saw Bet standing over him with a brandy bottle and a very reproachful face. Ah, you shouldn't have done so, sir. Really, you shouldn't. It ain't a kind way to act by persons as done the best they could for you. Thompson heard words of this kind, but what he said in reply he did not know. Mr. Betts, and perhaps even more Mrs. Betts, found it hard to accept his apologies and his assurances that he would say no word that could damage the good name of the house. However, they were accepted. Since the train could not now be caught, it was arranged that Thompson should be driven to the town to sleep there. Before he went, the Betsys told him what little they knew. They say he was landlord here a good while back, and was in with the highwaymen that had their beat about the eighth. That's how he come by his end. Hung in chains, they say, up where you see that stone what the gallows stood in it. Yeah, the fishermen made away with that, I believe, because they could see it out at sea, and it kept the fish off, according to their idea. Yes, we had the account from the people that had the house before we come. You keep that room shut up, they says, and you'll find there won't be no trouble. And no more there has been. Not once he haven't come out into the house. Though what he may do now, there ain't no saying. Anyway, you're the first I know on that's seen him since we've been here. I never set eyes on him myself, nor don't want. And ever since we made the servants' quarters in the stabling, we ain't had no difficulty that way. Only I do hope, sir, as you'll keep a close tongue, considering how an house do get talked about. The promise of silence was kept for many years. The occasion of my hearing the story at last was this, that when Mr. Thompson came to stay with my father, it fell to me to show him to his own room, and instead of letting me open the door for him, he stepped forwards and threw it open himself, and then for some moments stood in the doorway, holding up his candle and looking narrowly into the interior. Then he seemed to recollect himself and said, I beg your pardon. Very absurd, but I can't help doing that, uh, for a particular reason. 
What that reason was, I heard some days afterwards. And you have heard now.